students and all the dignitaries present to all for the annual event of Greenlix Institute of Management, CBIS 2022. Today, I, Tanya Agarwal and Vepa Karna, would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone present here to the marketing panel discussion of CBIS 2022. Every year, Sapiens focuses on a theme as the present industry is <coughs> Sustainability is the biggest policy of the future, and hence it becomes essential to integrate sustainability with business activity. In light of the relevance and importance it portrays, the theme of the marketing panel of Sapiens 2022 is sustainable marketing, balancing the three E's: economy, environment, and ethics. Sustainable marketing is a promotion of environment and social responsible products, practices, and brand values. It involves positioning brands as an active figure in environmental and social issues. It has the power to humanize the brand message and create another reason why customers should choose a brand over others. It is important because it promotes the core values that our business and our stakeholders actually value along with the positive societal impact it creates. Brand responsibility is becoming a popular brand value. Companies that announce environmental and social initiatives put the honors back onto the customers, challenging them to choose between the cheaper or the morally better option. We take a great pleasure to introduce you all to our panelists today. Our first speaker for the day is Mr. Abhinav Chamuni who is recognized and awarded as the Economic Times Young Leader in the year 2014. An engineering graduate from Punjab Technical University, Mr. Chamoli went on to pursue MBA in Marketing and Finance from Punjab University, Chandigarh. He has worked with prestigious companies like Infosys, KPMG, Deloitte, Adobe, and is also the founder of Fantopia, a digitally holistic health startup. Currently, he is the director and head of strategy at Grand Auto Mark LLP. Now, I would like Dr. Jones to welcome Mr. Chamoli to the staff. Please I would like to now extend warm greetings to Mr. Sunil Kumar Singh, one of the most respected individuals in the business circuits. He has expertise management and his first gamification session was with Product Tank. He studied at some of the most elite institutions like IIT Delhi, IIM Lucknow and Harvard Business School. He is co-founder of World of Webinar and has worked for illustrious works like Times Internet, Yatra, Make My Trip, Jibong, and Reliance Shield. He currently works for Microsoft as the Chief Product Manager for Growth and Gamification. He is also a well-known TEDx speaker. He has an excellent product sense <coughs> and keen attention to details. Now, I would like Dr. Jones to welcome Mr. Singh with us at Sinha. Mr. Rajiv Sinha is a global business leader with 30 plus years of experience in supply chain management, apparel manufacturing, and exports to the European Union with consulting experience in program management for manufacturing and retail verticals at NDD Data, IBM, and PWC. Mr. Sinha completed his BE in Mechanical Engineering from BIT Mestra and an MBA from MBI Rodar. Mr. Sena is a sustainability enthusiast and founder and director of Hollywood Future and founder and CEO of the Bank of Fashion Private Limited. And what more, Mr. Sena is a green plantation specialist having run multiple plantation drives for green the Aravali Hills in Gurgaon. We welcome you, sir. Uh, 
Our next panelist has far from the career for himself to a variety of specializations. From integrated media planning, brand marketing, customer success management, to business development, Mr. Kunal Kapoor has more than 3 years of rich experience in team management, business development, and strategic thinking <coughs> in the digital media and telecom sectors. He should receive credit for the expansion of several enterprises. He is the winner of Best Asian Award and Gold and Super Socrates Awards. He has overseen top tier accounts for several businesses like Selvin Solution, HD Media, Tata Teleservices, Dani Chowdhury, and many more. He is presently Vice President with Mogul Sokriti. So, we all welcome you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to welcome to marketing uh, panel of the Sapiens 2022 event. Uh, and a very warm welcome once again to all our esteemed panelists. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I know we are a little far out, but thanks a lot. So, as uh, all of us are aware, um, we are living in tough times. Okay, and that's not to be taken very lightly. Now, marketing, I believe, has a key role in delivering sustainability-friendly uh, products and uh, activities and interactions to the consumer. Why? Why is that? Because we are primarily a very customer-facing function, right? Uh, there's often been a question whether marketing, uh, which promotes consumerism uh, and uh, believes in more is good, uh, can be aligned to sustainability. Uh, the mantra of sustainability is less is more. Marketing is often more is good, right? So can they go hand in hand? Is it sustainable? There have also been questions about whether a company can focus on growth and profitability while pursuing sustainability. Now, just before we got in here, we were having an informal chit chat and this was one of the small things that we discussed. And of course, the panelists will enlighten you about what they think uh, the companies are struggling with or uh, need to focus more on. There are examples of many companies which have navigated this uh, problem and solved this uh, issue. And uh, two companies, just to name them, are ITC and there's an American company, a barrel company, which is called Patagonia. Both of them have pursued and achieved profitability while pursuing sustainability. So it's not impossible. There have also been doubts whether a country such as India can afford to sacrifice growth on the altar of sustainability. I think part of that uh, question arises because we believe that they are mutually exclusive. The panelists will tell us whether that is mutually exclusive or can we take them together. So marketing's role is to trigger the sustainability narrative uh, among the public at large. Um, you know, one statistic says that about seven or eight percent of uh, the population actually is aware of sustainability and about half of them actually practice it. Now that's a very small number and I think marketing will have to play a big, much bigger role in uh, pushing that uh, story forward. <coughs> now consumers have to also, I believe, demand it and marketers will have to deliver it. So unless consumers de demand it, 
I don't know what their take on it is, and I'm I'm excited to listen to what they're going to say about it. Uh, should consumers be so aware that they believe that they will be available uh, able to demand sustainability from companies, and in, if they do, what would companies do? Um, we could think of it in a SAFT model framework, which is survival, futuristic, trust generating, and affordable. So I think sustainability will have to be looked at from those four broad perspectives. And the last thing before I you know, invite my panelists to share their thoughts with you on some questions that I have, is that the movement towards sustainability uh, cannot afford to be slow and gradual anymore, I think. Uh, the cost of not being sustainable is for all of us to see. It's everywhere. Okay, so maybe we need a sharp jerk, sharp uh, twist uh, for, for things to move forward uh, because at the rate at which we are going, it may not be very successful. Okay, thankfully marketing can play a role in it because we have a vast array of tools in our repertoire. Right? Whether it's advertising, whether it's sales, product development, we have a whole bunch of things which marketing does. And I believe that uh, we do have a role to play, uh, just as much as the production team or operations team or logistics teams. All right. So with those uh, words, allow me to uh, welcome our panelists. And uh, I'll have a few questions. And uh, I will request my panelists to go answer it one by one. And uh, towards the end of this session, we will also open up the house for questions from the audience. I think the uh, MCs will be um, uh, sharing a number with you where you can message your questions and then they will ask, let me know the questions and we will ask, uh, send it to the panelists. Okay? All right. So with that, let me just begin by um, asking Mr. Abhinav. Let's start with Mr. Abhinav first. Uh, what are the challenges that face different industries in terms of adopting sustainability as part of strategy? So uh, the strategic element, if you could just highlight, sir. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Joe. Um, you know, it's, it's a very funny thing, right? Because sustainability is something that we hear about in so many forums, so many platforms. Uh, a lot of people pay lip service to it. Companies like ITC others actually invite that in their business. Um, but it's still something which is still not tangible, right? It's still theoretical, something you read about, right? So that, that's sort of in nature to it. Um, if I want to really simplify it, sustainability is the investment you make in your future, right? That's how I look at it. Because if you, it's, it's one of those things, if you don't take care of it, you may not pay the price, but that price will be borne by somebody. That's your next generation, the next set of uh, business leaders that will follow your footsteps, right? So anyways, it, it's, uh, and again, um, if I draw a very crude analogy, it's, it's like that crab that's in the boiling pot, right? The temperature's going up, but you know, Minute to minute, it doesn't really feel that difference unless it's too late, right? So coming back to the challenges, it's, if I if I were to really put this in a business construct, I think the first challenge is really accepting and understanding that it impacts you as business, right? It impacts your customers, it impacts your stakeholders. So at a leadership level, that's something that you have to accept in my culturally to start with, right? That that's one challenge to navigate. Uh, second part is in our existential capitalistic world. Um, it's really more profitability. Look, where am I drawing my bottom line? Now, unless you by choice say my bottom line is beyond just pure profit, it has to be on my environment, it has to be on the ethics of my business. It's not going to fly, right? And um, and the other thing that we were talking about is a lot of businesses, we need to understand where are they in their value chain, their growth maturity curve. If you're dealing with existential problems, you will not be thinking about sustainability, right? So how do we get businesses to, to really see this as beyond just the you know, obvious right in front of them, right? Uh, third part is it, it needs a bit of what I call imagineering, right? Imagination plus engineering. You can't solve problems by doing the same thing that you've been doing all these years. Somewhere at some point you'll have to say, well, look, I, I think there's an alternate way of doing it. Right? And sometimes it's, it's a matter of a horizon that you look at. You say, okay, look, in my mind, it's not a one 12 month project, it has to be a 36 month project, which means I need to solve multiple other things for this to be sustainable and grow long. So, in my mind, these are multiple sort of internal, external things that you need to balance on. Uh, and then beyond it, it, it has to come from a culture, it has to come from your DNA. Only and only then would you see that grow and sustain, it, not just in word, but also in spirit. Thanks, thanks a lot, Abhinav. Um, uh, Rajiv, would you like to uh, elaborate on that question? I'll just read it again. What are the challenges that face different industries 
in terms of adopting sustainability as part of strategy. Abhinav has spoken about culture, uh, establishing the culture for it. You worked in a lot of large companies, so yes, please. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I would like to remove the noise from everything. So when we talk about sustainability, these are all global words, the jargons, and a lot of uh, MBA and marketing have put these words in global warming, sustainability. We are not uh, talking about you know glaciers <laughs> and then two degree temperature. So there are a lot of things which are there, and what exactly it means to all of us. So in my terms, I I would like to remove the noise and make it simple for everybody. A very simple term: what is sustainability, and how do we look into that? So I'll, uh, I'll put the whole thing into perspective. One would be uh, simplification and the second will be storytelling. So I believe firmly in anything that needs to be communicated has to be done through storytelling. The first part, simplification. Let's say in 2001, when uh, uh, Gizmo was being launched by somebody who was like uh, the master of this game. So this guy comes on podium and he says, he doesn't talk about the technologies and the speed and, and things which are there. He puts the device in his lap, in his, in his hand and he says, 1,000 songs in your pocket. There was a launch of iPod, 2001, 2008, sorry. And then 2000, uh, and, uh, and after some time when he was launching the MacBook Air. So that time, this was another kind of you know, style, which was very simple. You don't talk about the speed, the Retina display, and a 10 GB processor, and 350 GB hard drive, so nothing like that. He comes with a plain Manila envelope, A4 size. He opens that, he takes out the laptop, and then he opens it. World's thinnest laptop. You don't have to talk about the processing speed or, or any kind of functionality. Everything is given. Similarly, when we talk about sustainability, we need to understand that, that it has to be part of our life. We have been sustainable from very beginning. I mean, if you look at India or culture, even <coughs> they're sustainable. And when we talk about our market, our business, our ethics, and, and how do we grow this, we have to simply define this in a world where it becomes a competitive advantage. See, you have so many people talking about sustainability, and you are forcing on organizations and business that you have to do this. Now, if you convert this into a different phase, you, know, you, you communicate in a way where this becomes your competitive advantage. If you are in apparel, while you know apparel is one of the most polluting industries of the world, I mean, second after oil. How do you convert this? You talk about eco-friendly garment. You talk about things which are sustainable. You talk about furnishing, you talk about things which are sustainable, and suddenly you have something which is beyond what others are talking about. So you have to not only simplify the message, you also have to see how this can be converted into profitability as a competitive advantage. The companies that we talked about, so that is Patagonia. Patagonia is an American organization and it has it is at the top of uh, you know the eco-friendly government. What they have done is, we'll talk about the processes uh, later on when I get the chance again. But what it has done is, it has hiked up the prices of the product by more than two x. So a simple bag that we carry in India, if you talk about the bag, it will be around five thousand, six thousand. You buy a Patagonia bag, it will be at least twenty to twenty-five thousand rupees in Indian currency. Recycled polyester. Using so all those gizmos and words, they have just removed everything and they're talking about sustainability. They position themselves at a point where others will be, think of them as a leader and then they start working towards it. I'm talking about storytelling. The whole thing has to be conveyed in a way which is simple and easy for people to understand. So I'll give you uh, some things. If you think of any brand which existed 200 years back, 300 years back, 500 years back. I don't think any of you will ever remember any brand which was there. Now let's put this in a story format. Arjun. The Arjun. So when you think of Arjun, you close your eyes and you see a warrior with a bow and arrow. Then you see a tree, there's a bird and there's a bird side. That is the focus of Arjun and that is what we know. If you think of Krishna, 
He's there with, you know, the, the Basri, so he's there. So these are vivid images, these are storytelling, and these have survived over thousands and thousands of years. So we need to not only make things simple, also convert them in a form of story. That's how we are going to do this. As we progress, we'll talk more about it. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, the storytelling part and the simplification of sustainability as an idea uh, so that people can, I mean, it becomes intuitive for people to understand and adopt sustainability. I think that could be one of the areas that marketers can focus on. And storytelling is what marketers do. All right, we do it all the time. In fact, we do too much of it, right? Anyway, thanks, uh, Rajiv. We'll come back to you later. Um, Kunal, can I have your thoughts on this quickly? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, in addition to what my fellow panelists have said, I mean, I totally uh, agree with them, and just building on upon you know what they have already said. Like you all, uh, you know, I'm sure in this room there are. Uh, many future entrepreneurs, right? Uh, many of you are going to work with prestigious brands. And what we have to realize is that why are we even talking about this, right? So, sustainability, uh, like what Mr. Raji said, like, it looks like a very fancy word, right? And in general view, uh, whenever we talk amongst our friends or in general, right? Uh, everybody had, has a very different perception to it. It, they have a very futuristic perception to this world, right? But if you go online and spend some time reading about uh, what's happening around the world, you will realize that it's what we need to do now, right? It's not a futuristic uh, uh, phenomenon or something of that sort. Uh, if we don't focus on sustainability now, in future, the topic of discussion will be survival, right? And if you uh, look at, I'm, I'm not saying go back, you know, 200 years or 300 years, just go back like 50 years or 60 years, read about our history post-industrialization and when, uh, you know, uh, that all, all that post-World War, that whole invention phase, what we have done uh, in the last 60, 70 years uh, to the planet, of course, men, a large part of it was, you know, uh, uh, at that time, that realization was not there, right? But off late, there are things, there are facts which are staring us, right? Staring at us, and we have to realize, even from an industrial perspective, from a brand's per perspective, if we forget about this whole concept and think about uh, uh, points like uh, profitability, right? <coughs> there also you will realize that till now, across the world, even in India, we have been following a linear structure when it comes to economy and supply chain and the whole business model. The linear structure as in, you know, take, make, waste. Take as in we take natural resources from the environment. We make, uh, we manufacture, we create goods and services, right? And then waste. Our whole system, our whole supply chain, our whole economic model is not designed to chuck waste out of the whole system, right? So the keyword to achieving sustainability or, you know, cracking the code is putting waste out of the equation. So these days across the world, different <coughs> brands, governments, what they are focusing upon is how to design the whole life cycle, design the whole supply chain in a way that right from the inception, you have a clear view about the end product and how do you reduce waste out of the equation, right? How do you recycle products? How do you uh, ensure that the end product, it goes back to the, you know, that whole linear model becomes circular in nature. So that's what the focus is right now. And it's, you know, there are studies uh, available online, you can go read. There, there are facts to prove that they actually result in things like cost efficiencies for brands, right? So there is a lot of scope for brands to work on different, as on different aspects like product design, service design, supply chain management, right from the inception to ensure 
that we remove the way the whole waste thing out of the equation that's the code to you know crack sustainability and that's how you will achieve cost efficiency because see uh, the natural resources the resources which are avail available to us renewable or non renewable everything right especially most of our economies most of our industries are running on non renewable resources right they are limited in nature when we started off with industrialization when we you know that we were in that invention phase there was a perception that these resources are unlimited in nature right but very soon like human beings have been there on this planet for like thousands of years right but within 60 70 years we have realized that that's not the case we have ended up you know uh, like we were talking about climate change we were talking about uh, the climate becoming hotter right so we have achieved this in just 30 40 years right so right now is the time to think about the future so it's not a futuristic concept in my view and uh, like like many of you i am also a student when it comes to sustainability i am also still learning about it uh, and like being part of this organization like we day in and day out hear about it so yeah uh, that's my okay thing on it we can talk more Thanks. about it yeah sure thank you uh, the fact that in the last uh, as rasmal said in the last 30 40 years we've uh, i don't know achieved it but we've achieved some wrong things i believe right uh, which brings me to the uh, other question see we've also been signatories to cop 26 and we have commitments in 2070 to be uh, carbon neutral or net zero right uh, that's not very far away you know it's like in your lifetime not maybe not in our lifetime but definitely in your lifetime okay so that is something a goal which is really worth uh, you know striving for and as kunal suggested read a bit more and as rajiv suggested let's simplify things and communicate story tell okay so that we become a uh, sort of sustainability warriors if that if we can have a term like that okay so um, next question that i have to sumit is we all agree that it's an important uh, thing to do uh, but it's not part of strategy yes for, uh, yet for many organizations it is not built into the strategy formula uh, formulation Uh, for many large except for very large companies so what are the opportunities for let's say smaller companies or medium sized companies which should, which can really benefit with this sustainability idea one is definitely sustainable competitive advantage what rajiv mentioned but uh, let's hear some more points because as he's coming from a, a tech company microsoft right so there's a lot of things that we can probably listen into yes over to you sir sure yeah great question thanks thanks for that um a couple of things which we can definitely do uh, when it comes to sustainability as a startup as a small setup how can we reuse things how can we upcycle things how can we uh, you know just make so much more out of the paper waste for example can we use the paper waste in the manure for example can we uh, throw away the coffee mugs can we use uh, can, can we reduce the electricity consumption in our in our startups and given the fact where we are as of today uh, you know we just need so much lesser energy consumption that's happening with everybody moving online why do you need so swanky offices can we move into a co working space uh, can and those are you know more on the transactional part of it when it comes to strategy part of it i think one of the biggest thing which is kind of missing uh, is the positioning of sustainability and the whole sustainability warrior a uh, bit of it is something which is uh, not positioned the right way and why i say so is that we talk about sustainability yes we drive sustainability initiatives absolutely yes but who are the champions who are the value adders in the society who are these people who are actually delivering value to a consumer and eventually capturing the value at the core of it the customer has to be the hero of the day but do you know how much food did you waste today do you guys know that at an organizational level we don't know that we are not tracking that that piece at all and that's an initiative that microsoft started so in in our daily emailers post lunch sessions we get an email every day saying today x number of kgs were being disposed and that number has come down from 800 kgs to a good 321 kgs that was yesterday's number creating this kind of awareness and creating this whole uh, you know 
giving numbers, and that's where a lot of gamification comes in, that's what I do, is that you have to give a feedback to the users. If you don't give a feedback to the users, how many coffees did you drink since morning? Anyone in the house? Anyone who's, who's taken more than four coffees today? Since morning? Yeah, I saw one hand. Don't be shy, that's okay, completely fine. You run on high dreams and four coffees, four. Anyone who's running on only one coffee a day? They're more sustainable. They're more sustainable. <laughs> Come to think of it, you are taking in lesser amount of sugar, lesser energy to really just do so much more. Nothing to do with the folks who are running on four cafes, you know, four coffee shops. Absolutely fine with that. But are you using the same cup? Are you reusing it, the whole thing? Are you using and throwing away half of the cup? I, I felt bad when I had to let go of my half a cup. I mean, given an option, I would have carried away my cup all the way to this, this panel and then have the coffee while I'm talking to you. But the, the, the idea here is that are we making the consumers aware of the value that sustainability really brings to you? We are not doing that. A lot of our awareness is still on the billboards or in these <coughs> boardrooms when we are talking about PNL sheets and a lot of sustainability <coughs> sits in the cost column still. Sustainability is still not sitting on the profit side, it's still not sitting on the asset side. And that's I think is a pivotal shift from a strategy standpoint that no matter which startup, whatever size of the startup you are at, you need to start thinking differently about the whole aspect of sustainability. It can take many shapes and forms. You know. There is no two doubts about it. But how, which side of the book do you really keep it? And how do you give this awareness and education to the user is uh, making the hero of the day is at the end of the, 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 the piece of the cake. Thank you, thank you, Sumit. Um, yes, very, very specific things that we can do, starting from a glass of uh, coffee, a cup of coffee, to something bigger. And as I always believe, we don't really have to do the big bang things for sustainability, right? It all uh, can be small drops which add up, like it went from 800 kgs of food waste to 321 kgs uh, in a span of, I don't know what the time span is, but I'm six sure months. six months. So that's, uh, that's per day. Per day. Per day. That's a huge amount of uh, sustainable action right then and there. And I believe that uh, it's happened because of the awareness creation. After every lunch or after every yeah. end of the day, the mail goes out to make people more aware. Yes. Yeah, so we, we can of display this number on the, uh, the place where we put the plates off. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a bin which is kept right there. And the, the, it's actually just keep weighing the cumulative weight. So you know at every point in time, if you're putting in another, you know, you're disposing your waste food, the number goes up. And it just hits you hard in case if you're really you know, disposing a lot of food which you didn't like. It is just uh, it <coughs> hits you hard the moment it goes away one kg. And the, the whole feedback loop, I mean, what you were saying, right? The, the feedback loop is something which you carry away with you. It, you may not really worry about it like on day one, but consistently when you're coming back to office again and again, and then you see this number going up, it stays with you uh, always. Great. Thank you, thank you, uh, Sumit. Um, going back to uh, Rajiv, uh, you work, you work a lot on the granular level, right? Uh, working with uh, communities, uh, working with your housing society, and so on and so forth, on building um, sustainability culture or awareness. Can you just throw some light on how we can do this in the non-corporate sector also? Sure. Again, a wonderful question. And uh, before I proceed, uh, there were two things which I missed out. First of all, meeting you all when we started. And uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat the word, but uh, yes. And then also, post lunch, I can see a lot of goopy eyes. So we'll try to make a little more interesting so that uh, you're there. The eyes are open, and then we can talk. So nothing wrong with that. It's OK. So. Yeah, we've all been in your shoes, just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we all have been there and uh, thanks Omid for highlighting two things, you know, again, two, two is coming, but from cost to profit, so that's very important. Whenever we look at a balance sheet, you must have gone through that, so when you put sustainability or anything in your cost side, then it's always you know, going to hit you, you have to decide on that. The moment it goes on profitability, where marketing comes into play, that becomes important. Thing. And second thing is, uh, regarding wastage. So wastage uh, could be anywhere. I mean, what he talked about in one of the office, but it could be anywhere in, if you go to managers or any function, you see the amount of wastage which is being done. And you see your friends, and you see your parents, and you see everybody, because it's free, 
because it's buffet, you fill it up. I mean, if you have been given a bigger plate, maybe you fill that also. And that's something that you learn. This is something, as Professor Jones said, these are small things that you can do. Make sure your plate, after you have eaten, is as clean as you had taken it. If you can do that, lick it, but make it clean. If there's any person sitting beside you, family, brother, sister, parent, tell them, observe, and tell them to clean it up. Make the plate as clean as possible. And then, the second thing, after that, go and wash your plate. So when you do, you throw the things in front of you, you know, and you let your parents' food also throw in the bin in front of you. These things, simple things will hit you. And it is not that uh, whatever they have achieved from 800 to 300, that is in one way, it's an achievement. But if you see why 300 kg is wasted, it has to straight away come down to zero. And you have to focus on that. So, why we look into things where we compare and then we go into relativity and we say, okay, from last year we are doing better, but we can do much better. We can always have a clean slate and do that. So, so I'll start my uh, thing. Uh, I'll take around five, six minutes. So you tell me if it is too much, then I'll just stop and we'll do it. Four minutes. <laughs> Four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so everything is storytelling for me. So for me, uh, my journey, uh, my journey or my life is in four different phases. I started my engineering, I, after my engineering I joined Merchant Navy. So that was a very different journey. I went on ship and uh, four years of Merchant Navy, a lot of fun, a lot of enjoyment, I mean that is one part. The other part comes when I look back, everything on ship is sustainable. The moment you are out from the port, the ship has to sail. Anything that happens on ship, you have to take care of that. If you are on a crude carrier, you go for around 35-40 days. So your water, your food, your waste, your consumption, your fuel, and then you have to carry the merchandise that you have to go and sell. So that is 95%. You have given, been given 5%. And how do you take care of that? You can't pollute, you can't throw, you can't do anything wrong, so everything has to be consumed. And that was a learning which I learned after 10 years after leaving that shipping thing. That wow, this is what I live and now we are talking about it. So when you simplify things, you suddenly realize that that was a sustainable life. I moved on to my next phase. During my last year of shipping, uh, with cans of beer, I decided let me go into an MBA. So then I studied on my last ship and then I joined MBA. I came out of that and I joined the corporate world. So corporate world, I was into SAP and I was into business transformations, traveling various countries. Let's say 15 years uh, from now, you know, before, I mean. And I could travel to countries which were all developed. Australia, uh, United States, Canada, and all these countries where I, wherever I used to go, I used to love the place, you know. Absolutely clean road, good sanitation, I mean, the pedestrian, everything was perfectly done, the houses beautifully done, the trees manicured, and everything like picture perfect. And I used to love the whole thing, you know, I mean, where am I and where is this country, India, where I have to go back? Now, after five years, I reflect back and then I realize. So I traveled to Denmark around 10 days back. And I realized that the same thing, everything is same, but I'm now wearing a sustainable lens. So my perspective changes. The whole thing is highly energy consuming society. There is not a single dirt anywhere. There is not a spider, there is not a dengue mosquito, there is not a lizard, there is nothing. There is bloody no ecosystem. Everything is devoid of the whole thing. They have created a bubble where they are living. There is no bird, there is no chirping of bird, there is nothing over there. And when I came this time back to India, I was overwhelmed with the thing. You know, the chaos, the birds, the cows, the dogs. I mean, I just loved everything. This is an ecosystem where we have to live. It is not a human-made world where only humans live. The whole thing is done for you. You have to live with everything. So you, this is my second learning of my life. The third thing came when I went into, I started to the Britain, I started a fashion brand called the Vanka. And uh, I mean, incidentally, it's there in your college. So there is a case study. And uh, there has been Vanka 1 and there is Vanka 2. And Vanka 3 will come, will come in a different avatar. 
So anyway, when it came, uh, we were talking about you know consumerism. You talk about marketing, so we're pushing, get more consumers, build new fast fashion, get people buy more, delivery in seven days, five days, six days. I mean three days, two days. Amazon Prime, one day, half day, thirty minutes pizza, ten minute pizza, and then I I see what shit is this? I mean why? Why are we talking about 10 minutes and 3 minutes and 2 minutes while we are talking? You want a cup of coffee, you put an app and somebody comes with a drone and then gives you coffee. Is it required? You have to think, when you think about sustainability, you have to think, is it required or we are just mindlessly going into consumerism? We just want it because it's there. You think of the logistics. I'm talking about 5 lakh shipment just from Mintra, which happens on a daily basis. 25 to 30 percent return, one, one and a half lakh return. The customer didn't like it. The fit is not good. You know, the shoe, I mean, I don't like it. I'll order four so I can wear all the sizes. Then I return it. I buy again. All of these are part of a lifestyle. That was the third phase of my life. I realized that too much, and thankfully, COVID, which taught a lot of things, you know, a lot of things which are unnecessary. You can live in minimalistic, minimalism. That brought me to the next phase where I founded a new company which is on sustainability. It's called Only Good. As the name says, we want to do only good. We want to create things which are only good. So five, six years back, I moved into sustainability. We, created, we started working on our society development, waste segregation. We went to each house and talked about waste segregation. We were thrown out of places. We were, I mean, literally abused. We picked garbage. Uh, before COVID, of course, I could pick, you know, so I could just go and pick. And we uh, got Nukkar Nata, we got people, students, everybody coming together. So small step, a society where I live, it's 175 acre society. It was uh, four years back, it was like a polythene society. Now, after this, I can proudly claim it's polythene free society. People are aware about it. Each park is so beautiful. You can just come and it will be like a, a paid park where you can see this beautiful park. Manicured trees, not manicured, I mean wild trees, but little systematic. You know? Lot of birds. I get up in the morning with birds chirping around, squirrels running around. So it's there, right in front of our eyes. There's a Ravali. We started working on plantation drives and started involving corporates, and things have started doing very well. So right now, we are into sustainability, trying to simplify things. All the ISOs and COP26 and carbon and carbon emission, methane, ethane, and how to convert that. It's again jargon created by the corporate world to confuse you. We are trying to simplify. Everything can be simplified. A simple energy consumption here. It can be simply mapped, and you can be given a target or a gamification, which could be a simple thing. Reduce your electricity of this room by 30%. Reduce the water consumption or wastage by this. And that's how we are. OK. All right. So that was, I think, a very close-up view of uh, four different phases of uh, Rajiv Sinha's life and how he has adopted sustainability as his motto for life, I guess? Yes, yes motto for life. All right, so uh, I'll just uh, switch the question back to Abhinav. Um, my question earlier was, uh, it started off with, uh, what are the opportunities that exist for business organizations if they do adopt sustainability as part of their strategy? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think it's a bit, bit of a misnomer, right, that uh, if you pursue sustainability, and um, Rajiv has shared his views, uh, it doesn't mean cost always, right? It's just how you look at it, how do you plan around it, right? I'll give you a few examples. Uh, take Walmart, right? So Walmart globally, uh, as part of the back office, had these lot of vending machines sitting around. And typically, you see vending machines, they have these bright lights and fancy touch points and whatever, right? Somebody just came up with a simple idea, like, look, why do I need those lights in the, during the day? Can I just find a way, you can still see what's inside them. Can I just find a way to optimize it depending on what time and what ambient light was? And then they, they started that project and you know, this got implemented across all the Walmart locations. And overall period of year, they realized they saved about a million dollars. Just imagine that, that one, probably they ended up putting some more additional technology, some coding back. Even as you with a few thousand dollars of investment, they saved a million on top of it, right? That's, that's huge. And nobody even thought about it. That, that, that was just accepted. From the first ask is, look, be curious and be aware of where you are. Like you mentioned, look, there's so many lights on. Do we need all these lights on today? Okay? Let's figure that out. Let's ask those questions. 
never shy away from asking that question. Uh, another case in point, uh, we've seen uh, even Amazon, right, is going into sustainable packaging, uh, you know, biodegradable. Now those little things go a long way in terms of how much garbage you create. Single-use plastic, you know, suppressing it, what are the alternate materials available? Somebody went, did that R&D, looked at that value chain and said, look, you know, I can substitute it with paper. Obviously, it comes with certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, failure points and then issues. But again, that's a viable alternative option that now you are living with, right? Um, and, and similarly, right, if you, if I take another example, we work with one company, uh, they basically was a, was a large manufacturing house and especially on the paper side, it was an insane old school, everything has to be on paper, stamped, signed by 10 people, the file goes from desk A to desk B. And then they realized just the storage cost of all that garbage they were collecting, like hardly anybody ever went back to it beyond a certain point, but they were collecting heaps of that garbage and they were so uh, stuck up in their way, they said, look, no, it has to happen this way. So we went in that room and said, look, have you, have you calculated the cost of doing this? Is the paper cost of what you're trying to do? Where's the ROI on it? They said, no, no, sir, it's required. Somebody may ask, government may ask, this guy may ask. Uh, whenever we went and answered those questions, we realized that just by implementing a simple document and digital solution, we are able to eliminate that entire process, right? So why do you need somebody, you got a, everybody has a smartphone today. Why don't you put that workflow in the smartphone, somebody signs it off and that's, that's, that's evidence enough? Right? Uh, even if from a regulatory perspective, I need to keep some invoices, even the government is not going e-invoice way. So, you know, suddenly you realize that if you just open up your mind to it, it's not just better process, optimal processes, it's also pure cost saving. So, I mean, there's an ROI inbuilt into it, right? And I'll take one last example uh, for another case in point. See, look, uh, when you talk about innovation, let's take marketing for that matter, right? Go back, uh, go back to your, court, uh, your your marketing, Philip Kotler's and everything, right? Uh, it was always, look, this, you need to print giant billboards, you need to have pamphlets, you need to have, you know, you need to have booklets and what and what not. And even, you know, my friend will validate this, right? So, historically, when media was all about print media and, and magazines and, and it used to be all over the place and it got, it got sold to the garbage guy, the rubbish guy, you know, later on. Now with digital marketing coming in, that whole market still persists, right? Except that now it's all called digital. Now I see ads coming on my newspaper which I read online. Uh, I have an app which shows up whatever I'm still interested in. I still get to know it. I can transact it. It's more personalized. So not the innovation hasn't just replaced it. It's made that better. So I don't see, for example, I don't want to see uh, kurta pajamas. I won't see it, right? Because the system at a point didn't realize what my interests are what my uh, needs are and even beyond from a tech standpoint uh, that helps go a long way so not only has the technology transformed it has made this so much better at a more sustainable price point right so again like i said going back to the imaginary e equation it's about how do i understand that problem and instead of solving it linearly look at an alternate approach right zoom out and then zoom back in so that's okay. back to you yeah thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kunal, uh, yeah. would you like to comment on some uh, opportunities that you see other than the usual ones that we already know about? Yeah, I mean, he's absolutely right. Uh, In fact, uh, it's a lot about awareness, right? And uh, brands across the globe are taking those steps in that direction. Uh, I, I think many of you must have used WeTransfer, right? So, uh, we are aware, WeTransfer, they purge all their files after seven days. So that's a step towards sustainability. Not only it saves them a lot of cost. So see, uh, another misnomer when it comes to sustainability is that a lot of it is seen as tangible, right? Waste and all these things. Even when it comes to digital, we leave carbon footprint everywhere. For that matter, even when you do a Google search, right? There's a server sitting somewhere, which is, you know, uh, using energy to function like whenever you do a Google search, there also you are burning carbon. Although as compared to many other industries, it's very, uh, you know, uh, small in percentage, but still you are doing that. So there also uh, organizations across the world are taking steps like they are going for service providers or server systems which are using renewable sources of energy. And they are also taking those steps in that direction. And honestly speaking, if in the whole world, 
in any if there is any country where sustainability is the easiest to adopt and where it can be uh, you know uh, implemented in the fastest uh, manner possible is india why because if you go back to our roots in our culture sustainability is there in our dna right you think about our uh, elders and you think about those terms have you heard heard about things like uh, you know item being passed from generation to generation being used now it's not happening anymore because we are moving away from our culture but if you actually introspect and you if you think in that direction people in ancient india were like much more scientifically advanced in their thinking that their whole lifestyle was designed around sustainability reusing things right using uh, that minimalistic approach which we were talking about it's embedded in our culture in our dna so we need to go back to our roots and like i said for indians it's the it's going to be easiest uh, as compared to other countries to adopt this lifestyle even uh, not only in personal life in our corporate lives when we are part of an organization or we have our own startup to take all these steps uh, also uh, apart from uh, profit profitability i sincerely believe that uh, it's our duty to give back to the society to the nature right so there are organizations which are taking step in that direction also uh, there is an organization called eco shia eco shia right it's a kind of a search engine so there is just like google right you go there you search for any term for every search they plant a tree in a year they plant around quarter of million trees uh, in different countries that's what is their business model they uh, i don't think they are uh, working from profits but that is something and they are growing year by year right i don't exactly know their business model but that's there in existence right they are growing so it's all about thought process uh, realizing its importance and you know uh, tomorrow many of you will start your own venture at that time right from the scratch when you think about your business model when you think about your supply chains at that time only uh, if you like earlier i spoke about that circular uh, uh, economy right right at that time only if you think about how to launch products how to launch <laughs> services which are by nature you know uh, which can be recycled which can be reused uh, mind you you know there are mobile phone companies around the world there are jeans brand around the world whose product those products are designed in a manner that when they no longer are usable they take those products back recycle them you know upgrade them and give it back to the consumer or the customer and they work on that model and that not only helps them in retaining their customers for a very long time it helps them saving a lot of cost it results in a lot of cost efficiencies also so it's a proven model uh, and there are studies available online to read about it so yeah that's my thoughts yes. one of the things that uh, kunal mentioned was our divergence from uh, our old culture where it was sustainability was part of our lives um i have another thought which i wanted to share with sumit probably you could comment on this do you believe that the fact that we are becoming economically stronger is the reason why we are becoming non sustainable you know use and throw culture right the fact that we can buy anything whenever we want the fact that we don't live in a scarcity economy anymore is that the reason why we are less sustainable uh, as a consumer right if since it's a marketing panel i'll talk about the consumer do you think so yeah maybe but perhaps there is there is more to what you see or you know what means the i uh, on one side we saying there is just tons of products out there that we have a lot of disposable income we can use and throw and we can buy some <coughs> stuff that's definitely there uh, but come to think of it the products that we are getting actually these products in itself are not uh, multi-use products if the products were multi-use products we would have probably used them i mean how many times do you remember that back in the days when uh, when we when we were kids our parents used to eat and use those brass thalis 
and they would use generations by generation. They would just polish it every year around Diwali and we would then start to use them again. Those are nowhere to be seen. The brass industry itself has gone for a toss. Now, of course, there is a lot of other uh, you know, sanitization aspects of it. There are product design aspects of it. There is this whole uh, you know, global culture shift that's happening. We are getting so much more influenced by the Western world. But that said, if it, even if that was not so true, the way we are kind of you know evolving, so there is definitely what there is some truth to that. Yes, we everybody wants novelty. Everybody would want to kind of you know do better, you know experience life. And as Rajiv mentioned, traveling to Denmark and US is a span. span, Go to Singapore, it's a plastic life. It's bubble. It's like shiny. It's so amazing. Looks beautiful. But is that sustainable? Perhaps not. Even for the human minds, for that matter, it's not sustainable because after a point in time, you're living in Singapore, you get so bored that you are done with that novelty. And especially the folks who've been traveling and living in the suitcase, they would agree with me that if you talk to, if you really talk to your friends in US who've been living in US, the folks living in US are really alone, and that's a legit problem right now. It's hitting the psychological balance of people. They want to come back. So many of my friends have come back to India now, especially with their kids who are four or five years of age. Because they, they're not able to pick up a language because there's no one to talk to. Right? So there are so many more aspects of a living sustainable, uh, you know, sustainable life than just the consumerism part of it, which is also what kind of you know decides which way to go uh, and which way to not. Okay, great. Holistic perspective, right? So it's not just the consumer, but the way we are living our lifestyles, including how lonely we feel, that may also be driving the, you know, the whole wagon towards non-sustainability or, or getting away from that, avoiding it also. Okay. Uh, one question that, that's been in the, in the theme is, um, is there any connection between sustainability and ethics? Now, we've done economy, we've done environment. But what about ethics? I mean, uh, can we look at sustainability from an ethical perspective? I think in the introduction, uh, Webhav mentioned the morally better option. Is sustainability a morally better option, Sunil? Yeah. 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 Yes, Webhav. Yeah, um, so I, I, I think this is, this is the human condition, right? Um, we may, we may want to talk about the hard aspects of capitalism, but unless it's it has that human touch to it and the other sort of humane aspects of it, it's not going to really resonate beyond a point in time, right? Uh, because extra money means only so much unless you can contextualize it. So, so coming to the point of ethics, right? So, if take, going back to the ITC example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, look, nobody is telling you do not grow. Nobody is telling you, you know, don't look at growth of your business, about your profits, or your take home salaries and what and what not. But, you know, every time you cut corners doing that, Every time you, you know, like I said, for sustainability perspective, you you pay a price, uh, and you're using resources which probably belong to your next generation, right? So it's coming at a price that maybe not out of your pocket, but it's out of your collective uh, economy or humanity at that, right? So until unless you wear that lens of look, what is the right way about it, you'll get it wrong at some point in time, right? So coming to the whole ethical aspect of sustainability, look, it has to start from a point of saying, look, what I am doing today, is it the right thing to do, right? Can I do this better, right? Even when the cost of that decision is not black and white in front of you, right? So you need to take up that moral high ground and then look at your business and say, oh, look, what additional can I do? Uh, how can I make sure that this is covering all these grounds? Uh, what am I taking to market? It's, it's not just, uh, an immediate, like he was telling, right? It doesn't solve an immediate, it's not like a sugar rush. It's not like that candy eating. It is healthy eating at some point in time, right? So, you know, it's easy to quickly go grab a burger and be done with it, right? It, it gives you the initial high end kick. But is that sustainable? Because you pay a price with your health. You pay a price with other 10 things, lifestyle ailments, which will come on to you later. Uh, that's where the ethical aspects of business come into play. So you say, look, if I'm doing this, how can I make this better? How can I add an element of reusability? How can I add an element of uh, reducing wastage? How can I add an element of uh, you know giving back to what I'm doing? So today, if I'm if I'm creating a high energy ecosystem, 
I'm going and planting trees to supplement it at some point in time, right? The other side of it is, uh, fine, a certain businesses like, uh, you know, I'll give you one more example quickly, uh, which is like manufacturing, like clothes manufacturing. It is high intensity business. But people, what are doing now is using uh, AI tools and other demand forecasting principles to reduce what kind of manufacturing they do. If there are 10 pieces, can I figure out which piece will make more sense and will have higher demand versus others? Uh, and this needs data. This needs a different way of, uh, of production, it needs a different way of marketing. Uh, but short of it, it still sells. It still gives you tangible ROI uh, with the right EQ, IQ uh, to drive it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Abhinav, for that. I'll uh, add on to Yes, this. please. I'll just add on to this one. So, nothing for and against any company, but uh, just visualize Tata Reliance. Okay, so no smiles. I'm just telling. Just because they're doing things more towards CSR, towards environment, towards sustainability, it gives you trust. So trust comes with that. It also gives you that ethical point of view. Few months back, you know, three superstars with this ad, you remember? Yes. So remember, it's so powerful. These three superstars were known for their ethics, for their culture, for their devotion. And just with this ad, they suddenly went down in the crash. They had to revive their image, they had to shed the whole thing. Similarly with uh, one of the bonds. So the bond credibility went down when he said, Gutka, you know, Shikhar Gutka. Imagine Pierce Brosnan with that ad. And so it comes with that, whether we believe or we don't. If I told you my story, so 10, 15 minutes back I told you my story. When I talk about sustainability, when I talk about tree plantation, I incidentally have been, have been running an NGO for the last 22 years. So that, if I say that, that gives trust you. So you start trusting. So that's how it happens. The moment you go into these kind of things and when you can build a connect with sustainability, with uh, ethics, it automatically builds everything. The whole story gets complete. So that's the point. Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Um, Sumit, from a Microsoft perspective, ethics, marketing, sustainability, any quick points? So, uh, lesser known fact about Microsoft, but our data centers actually lie in the sea, in the ocean, in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We don't use uh, artificial computing, uh, you know, artificial ACs and stuff. We've buried our data sensors somewhere off the coast of Bombay, and they're actually lying in water, so that there is absolutely no use of you know air conditioning. Uh, the bags that we use in Microsoft are all uh, re uh, reused and recycled uh, ocean waste. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the examples of how <coughs> serious we take uh, sustainability and uh, environment consciousness uh, at the core of it. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, one of the other questions that has been uh, sort of uh, on my mind is, if sustainability is such a big deal, why is it not in the vision and mission statement of many companies? You know, while I was researching for this particular panel, I went through maybe 120 vision mission statements. I did not find sustainability as a word or even a thought mentioned in many of those. So um, I'd just like to open it up and give us your views about why do you think or do you think it's time that people need to really think about this from the topmost layer, which is the vision and the mission statement for everybody else in the organization who really believe in it and accept it? Yeah. So, uh, you know, vision, mission, you know, while we, we read a lot about it in the MBA days, the reality of it is uh, they're more of guiding principles rather than something that the organization regularly visit and update. Right? So that's one reason why you don't see uh, as much at that level. Uh, but the second part of it is, uh, and sort of going back to my original point, at some level, unless you are imbibing it culturally and propagating it, right, both in, uh, you know, just writing on the wall as well as what do you reward and what do you incentivize in terms of investments and in terms of your business, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. So, so in essence, uh, yes, uh, the ask is I would like to see more of uh, companies openly, publicly declaring their love for the future, right? So it has to show more. Uh, but beyond it, I think beyond just the words, it has to show in the way people 
uh, conduct themselves. Uh, and like we've had umpteen examples of how good businesses are doing that, going the extra mile. But to me, I think that's that's a real make or break uh, when it comes to sustainability and future. I would want to counter that. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Huh? That's another that happy part of this. So, uh, you know, what you're saying is largely correct for a lot of companies, especially the the brick and mortar kind of companies, right? But when it comes to product-based companies, uh, be it Meta, uh, Netflix, Amazon, Uber, Microsoft, there is obviously this one guiding principle, and you know Microsoft's vision is to empower everyone to achieve more, and uh, you know Netflix's mission is to entertain everyone Every on the server. Whatever products they make, it has to align to that particular mission and vision statement. If, they, if it's not really aligning to that vision statement, then probably they will not make that product, right? Um, Facebook is to bring everybody close together, which is why WhatsApp is there and all the other social community products are around. The reason why sustainability perhaps may not be defined or you don't see it in the vision statement is because the definition of sustainability itself is broken at this point in time. We don't know what sustainability really means. If you are able to define it, you will be able to measure it, control it and achieve it. Right. We've not been able to define sustainable. What does it mean for us to be sustainable today? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for an electrician? What does it mean for an organization? Everybody has a vision to put a roadmap, achieve more, yes. Even for Great Lakes for that matter, you will have a roadmap you want to achieve more, da da da, da right? Does that mean you're sustainable? Perhaps not. Right? Okay. And somewhere there, the definition of sustainability is something which is a miss by the longest yard. If you are able to do it, maybe we will be able to achieve it. Hey, what's your, what's your problem? <laughs> That's perfect. I mean, sustainability uh, for everybody is different. If you talk to a labor, laborer, for them, sustainability is existence. Eating the next meal is sustainability for them. If you talk about middle class education of their kids or, or maybe settle, I mean, uh, marriage is a sustainable lifestyle. If you talk about scientists, it's something else. So, incidentally, I was sitting, uh, as you were talking, I was just thinking, I was sitting in a plush uh, Denmark office with my fashion designer buyer sitting in front of me, and she said, You need to have all the certification in place. Your uh, workers and your factories should not have any worker less than 18 years of age. I said, it's not, it's never there. She said, no, no, but uh, you have to get this in writing because it was happening. I mean, 15 years back of the carpet industry had that. Then she said, you need to have a compliance certificate, a social certificate, and a global organic trade certificate. Uh, so I said, these will cost money. She said, yes, I know. I mean, we can't increase the price, uh, but uh, you have to get all of these and you have to get all norms. And talking about all of these, then I said, you have such a big place, why don't you put solar? So she said, uh, I mean, solar, we are just thinking and we have to you know, look into this. Then she took, took, she took out this much of you know uh, these uh, tissue papers and just cleaned her hands and threw all of them there. Then I go to the toilet, it's like loads of tissue papers. The tissue papers in case are toilet paper roll that we use, like in some of the affluent families we have started using, which we never use. So for them, this is like, uh, you know, one bucket means you can say around 30 to 40 rolls they use on a daily basis. And they teach us about sustainability and what things should be done. So it's completely uh, contradictory to what people talk about. When COVID hit, you remember Australia? The yeah. biggest news in Australia was toilet paper being run out, you know. And people were, you know, <laughs> fighting with uh, others. The malls were like swamped with people. What toilet paper? In India, I mean, <laughs> toilet paper, we don't even use it, you know, so it's not required. So it's very different for everybody. For us, I mean, wasting a little bit of things or, or sitting in a comfortable AC is, is part of our lifestyle. But for others, this is luxury. So it depends, I mean, how you define it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Rajiv. Um, the fact that, and also Sumit, the fact that sustainability has no one meaning. It depends on the context, it depends on the country, it depends on the kind of people that we're talking to. So I think part of marketing will be to understand your target audience very well. Understand what sustainability means to that core target segment and communicate appropriately. Now which brings me to my last question before we open it up to the house for uh, questions from the audience. I don't know, 
uh, this is a take that I'd like for, to hear from all of you. Do you think that CMOs, chief marketing officers of companies should be also quizzed? One of their KRAs should be, what has been your track record on sustainability? Who is CMO? Yeah, Kunal. You could go first. I think I, I'm not sure how uh, uh, does that matter in the uh, when it comes to the bigger picture. But uh, in addition to that, to your previous question also, right, regarding the mission and vision yeah. statements, I think more than sustainability being a part of those statements, other word, more important thing is how actual adoption is uh, when it comes to brands and industries. Uh, what the actual ad adoption is, and I strongly feel that a lot of it has to do with consumers also. Uh, as so, on at on one side we are like uh, like all of all, all of you are aspiring brand managers or you know entrepreneurs, but at the same time you are consumers also. You know, so it's it depends a lot on you guys uh, because the data suggests that uh, when we talk about demographics, the millennials and the younger audience. That's where bulk of this online buying is happening, right? So it depends on you that when you buy these products, when you leave your reviews and ratings online, how do you directly or indirectly compel these organizations, these brands to adopt sustainability as part of their ecosystem? When you prefer products from brands who have sustainability as an integral part of their whole ecosystem. That's where, you know, that's when these brands will be compelled to adopt it. So it depends a lot on the customers also, right? That we make smart choices, we leave actual correct reviews for them to read, right? I'm not sure they read all the reviews, but of course, uh, that depends a lot on the, uh, it. And uh, at the same time, you know, uh, there's another end to the spectrum also. There's a term called greenwashing, right? Like in SEO, you have black hat. In sustainability, there's a term called greenwashing. It means brands portraying their products as being, you know, uh, eco-friendly or them, you know, uh, like they following a whole sustainable mode of functioning, but actually it's not the truth. So. That's called like greenwashing. That's what many of the brands are also doing, not only in India, across the world. So that as consumers, we need to be aware, we need to be smart while choosing these products. And that's how we'll be able to bring about the change. So brands only, so it has to be a collective responsibility as a society, right? Brands and consumers together. Then only we'll be able to uh, achieve it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the reports said, one of the UN reports said, I believe that um, it's not just brands which are doing greenwashing, it's also governments and countries. They also sign up for a lot of things but don't do half the things that they promise. Right? So it's not just a marketing problem, it's also probably a political problem. So that's uh, something to be really aware of. And I think as uh, students, as citizens, young citizens, we need to take people to task. But first, we have to clean up our own house on sustainability. Avinav, yes, on that? Yeah. No, I, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's a collective responsibility, right? Um, not one single party can do it alone. Uh, but I, I think as, as the next generation, right, or, and the coming generation, uh, we need to be more demanding, right? Uh, it, it's no longer OK to say, fine, uh, my interests don't matter. My future does not matter. Go, go dig oil, go do whatever with the environment. You need to be demanding that. I, I think that's something which I absolutely echo. Uh, but I, I think what really sort of spans out, right, as, as a poor CMO, I think that's where the conversation started. Uh, you know, as, as, the, as a custodian of the brand language, as a custodian of the brand messaging, it's absolutely critical for, for each of these CMOs to be vocal about it, uh, absolutely set forth the tone of, of each of these brands to say was, look, here is a company that genuinely not just in, in, in words and in fancy billboards, but also in the practice, right? So it goes back to the entire operation behind the scenes are, are, are doing this. I mean, you'll be surprised a lot of, lot of if you go to the, these markets and buy organic dals, and if you were to ever do a homework and read the fine print, they are just blended. So this is the normal dal blended with like 10% organic, and they're calling it organic, right? So it's 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 unethical 
right? It's it's playing with your health. Even for that matter, they see he. Yeah, they see he and all these things. Yeah. Um, so at some level, the CMO has to be the custodian of that brand promise, and 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 for that matter, they also need to uh, push and be their own champions in the organization to say, look, uh, beyond just smart words and fancy titles, uh, the organization has to pivot to a point where this is both sustainable and uh, you know profitable at that. Right. So I think that's that's how probably the poor CMO has to play double hand uh, and make sure that it is both from a customer perspective as well as internally uh, going the right way. So absolutely, I echo. I mean, some of these softer aspects of innovation about sustainability, about uh, corporate governance uh, should flow into their report cards uh, and be part of their comps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sumit and Rajiv, yeah? please quickly ask uh, the CMO question. <laughs> So in I my mind, my time for the last thing. <laughs> so in my mind, if you ask me, uh, the custodian of sustainability lies with admin and ops, or maybe product guys, because they are the ones who would. So a CMO would essentially you know, paint the vision, give a brand, put some jargons, da da da. But how do you translate that into reality? Is what a product guy and admin and ops really do? So if the product guys don't do the right kind of product management, they're not sourcing it from... So we have tons of these examples of farm to table. Right? There is the whole logistics which is working behind it, which lets you know that, okay, this particular pack of apples has been packed from... Is evolved that whole logistics supply chain at that level. If that is not supported by the right kind of operations, then the whole thing will fail. So CMO definitely is the brand custodian, yes, is, is the custodian of sustainability promise. But getting it delivered and really turning this whole vision into reality is the whole lot of organization which is running behind. behind that. Yeah, thanks. In marketing, we talk about the value network, right? And I think we talked a lot about uh, our suppliers and suppliers, suppliers, and keeping a track of what they do and what quality they maintain and stuff like that. So I think that's also part of the CMO's role, I believe, now going into the future. Uh, one of the earlier phases was that the marketing guy had to be a technology guy because that was how, that was what was driving business now. But I think going into the future, now in the future, would be that they would also have to be sustainability champions or as Abhina mentioned, custodians of the sustainability promise. Right? While the operations guys deliver it, marketing guys will have to paint that picture as you rightly put it, the right words. Thanks. And uh, Rajiv, yeah, your final words on that? So I was just thinking how long do we have this session and then I looked at both the sides and uh, people blocking so we have to answer everything before we do. Because we have 10 minutes for further questions. So of course, uh, anything that the, the brand, sorry. Oh, there are? Okay, all right, so let's do it brief. <laughs> okay, so, okay. So as, as the brand promises something, it has to be understood by the marketing person and should be able to communicate or promise the same. And should also be able to dwell upon the fact that whatever is being promised is actually possible or not. For example, when we talk about organic, it's a very uh, common word and uh, you can pay a little higher price for that. But organic means end-to-end, -end, from, from your farm to the place, or from cradle to cradle that we call, or cradle to grave, whatever I mean, language or jargon that we can use. But any point, if it fails in the organic part, then it fails, the chain fails. So they have to understand, the marketing person also needs to know operations and make sure that whatever is being promised, it's possible. That's how it has to be done. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Um, we are now open for questions and I think the MCs will be leading out the questions. And if the speaker has any particular, uh, sorry, if the questioner has any particular panelist that they want to ask, otherwise it will be open to the, anybody. Okay. Thank you, sir. So the first question is asked by Anushka Singh. How IT industries will inculcate sustainability in their supply chain? Supply chain. Uh, can I repeat the question? <coughs> IT industries in supply chain, yeah. uh, inculcate sustainability. 
Oh, tens of it. I mean, there's this huge furor, if you remember, with Amazon sending these big boxes and so sending a pack of Colgate inside of it, right? There are just tons of those examples that are there. Of course, Amazon must have done some calculation to optimize their supply chain, the number of, you know, volume by the carrier ratio, etc., etc. But uh, that completely backfired and that really did push the teams to think again about how do they really do the packaging. So really reduce your packaging, reduce your single-use uh, single plastic, move over to paper yeah, as much as possible wherever you are able to. In fact, the other day I received a packet uh, which had only the Amazon tape. That's it. And, and it had some, you know, my invoice stick to that uh, article that I wanted and that was locally delivered. So in case if you are not shipping it on long distances, you are doing a hyper-local delivery, then use a minimum state branding and just use uh, the, the, the basic footprint as possible. I think that's one of the easiest ways in which you can do that. Uh, Anushka, did you mean IT, ITS or IT driven companies? I mean, uh, do you mean pure? Pure IT. Pure IT, yeah? Okay, that's what I was thinking. You mean the software company? Yes. Okay. So, I'm very curious, software with supply chain only or supply chain focused? Okay, now I'm confused. Anushka? Okay, how they can pursue sustainability? Okay. Oh, so, uh, okay, so in case if it's a large org setup, in which case there are tons of the other initiatives. Um, so you end up warming up the ocean? Yeah. Um, because I think the service will need cooling, right? I think we have enough water in the ocean right now to cool, <laughs> cool the world. We are in the ocean. <laughs> Okay. No, in fact, I would like to add to that. There are brands uh, uh, or IT companies in India and abroad. So, a large part of the like, software companies that you are talking about, they deal with data centers, right? So, a large part of energy consumption and that sustainability uh, part, you know, it, it has to be implemented there. So, they are taking steps in that direction. Like, for example, they are setting up their own data centers or they are tying up with data centers who rely on renewable sources of energy, right? Solar energy or other sources of energy. And they are uh, re reducing, they have it, like, okay, I'll talk about Dentsu. Uh, Merkel Sokrati is a part of Dentsu. It's not typically an IT software company, but we are into digital, so part of that whole uh, IT industry. But in Dentsu, it is one of our main goals as an organization to reduce our carbon footprint by 90% by 2040 and this goal was defined in 2019 I think, and I think uh, as per the latest uh, data which we have received in our annual report we have already achieved 25% of it right in the last three years so the and it's by, by taking steps like these like, you know, like I was talking about uh, so Densu globally uh, I'm not sure about India because in India they are still establishing themselves. Uh, they're pretty big, uh, but still. Uh, in other countries, uh, most of their offices, their, their energy is driven by renewable sources of energy, like solar energy or this thing. So they are, they have it in their agenda to reduce the carbon footprint by 90% by 2040. So these are the kind of steps which uh, IT or software industries can take in that direction and of course then there are uh, uh, steps being taken by individual driving their em employees to adopting a sustainable you know lifestyle when they are in office or at home by uh, we have already uh, uh, heard about many examples like no, not using single-use products uh, right not wasting electricity those kind of things like in Densu we have several initiatives uh, we have a, an initiative called One Day for a Change that happens every year wherein people all across uh, the country and globe they volunteer for activities, right? They go to a beach to clean it or many other activities. They, they tie up with, a, with an NGO to spread awareness about uh, wastage. So these are the steps which the organizations are taking in that direction. Yeah. Is for the from so, 
This question is, can a product with similar utility and value pyramid only be sold and established a market in terms of sustainability with underlying fact of enormous price differentiation? Could you repeat the question? You'll have to, that was a very long question. You'll have to make the questions very short, you know. It's longer than the panel discussion. <laughs> Can you repeat it, please? Yeah. Can a product with similar utility and value pyramid only be sold and established a market in terms of sustainability with underlying fact of enormous price differentiation? Not, not really. Okay, we'll we'll take that in the in the last part if we have time. Sorry. You can answer that. Question is not sustainable. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Please go so, ahead, Raju. So basically, any product, you know, I mean, a simple water bottle like this, we are selling it or we can buy it for ten rupees. The moment I say it's pure Himalayan water, taken from the source, and if I put those marketing gimmicks into this, it can be sold at 60, 60 rupees or maybe six times multiplier. If I add minerals into this, another two times multiplier, so it can be done. Similar with uh, any garment, any suit that you're wearing. The moment I put a label, or I put it with somebody who has created it, handcrafted, bespoke, the words can be used, you know, and then you can put it any value that you want. So it can be done, yes. Not true or uh, not uh, ethical, uh, so I'm not talking about that, but yes, it can be done. Thank you all the panel members for answering the questions. Now I would like Dr. Kumar Shankar to present the token of <laughs> I thought you had a lot more questions. We have time. We have? Yeah, 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 yeah. Five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, third question is by Ritik Saha. Can you please enlighten us about some of the impacts of green marketing on consumer behavior and sales? It's not a sustainability question, it's a marketing mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it's a marketing question. You want, does, does the does the questioner want us to look at it from a sustainability point of view? So the impact of green marketing on sales and consumer behavior. Green marketing, from that perspective, on consumer behavior. So uh, you know, remarketing is all about uh, personalization, and that's something what Google's and all the adverts of the world are doing. So definitely, yes, there is a tons of. Uh, personalization, that's of targeting that's happening across the ecosystem. Um, you name a brand, in fact, the, the, these devices are actually snooping on the conversation. You throw a brand and tomorrow you start seeing the ad on Instagram. It is so snoopy at this point in time. Uh, so, remarketing is, yes, definitely the lever which actually did boost the entire digital marketing, uh, so to say. Without remarketing, digital marketing alone probably will not be able to drive this the right kind of a, a cost or the price benefit that uh, they are actually commanding. So it does, yes. And a lot of gamification actually does happen on that as well, sir. Okay. We'll take one more. Last the next question. This question is from Janati Kiriti. She wants to ask Do you think capitalism has impacted sustainability in India? Okay, that next question is not for me at all. <laughs> <laughs> but capitalism has impacted sustainability. So, uh, so this is, you know, interesting question, uh, but I think you need to go to the depth of it, right? Uh, capitalism, if you buy, go by definition, means that using your resources to earn profit, right? Or the maximum utilization coming out of it. Sustainability only puts a different lever or lens on top of it. It says, look, don't be so myopic about profitability that you miss the bigger picture. Don't be so myopic about, uh, you know, your bottom line that you miss the complete business itself, right? That's what sustainability says. Uh, I, I would say they're conflicting. It's a matter of perspective, right? Uh, you need to look at a problem solved through different lenses and then graduate towards look where it has to be core business, where it has to be some value add on top of it. And it all will be validated by the market and consumers, right? So, you know, that's what businesses need to balance out. So to me, uh, they do work together, uh, but you do, do need to have a bit of a creative hat to make it work and, and scale at that scale. Another answer. Thank you, sir. I have a add-on question. Yeah. Uh, Please, sir. A mic to Professor Venkatesh. No, I think also. No, for everybody else also. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> the question is, uh, uh, it's an addendum to what she does. It's, it's fraud, discussion on capitalism. So, so for example, uh, in the developed countries, uh, there, is a, there is a convention, almost a rule, where pharma products, drugs, prescribed, prescribed by a doctor, can only be filled by a chemist and brand names don't matter. In India, we wanted to do that. The government has also listed that these drugs need to be sold through their active ingredient and not by the brand names. Right? In my thinking, in my assessment, I think this is the most sustainable way to go ahead. But will CMOs like you agree? Thanks for the standard there. Uh, so there's, there's no black and white answer to that question. I'll explain why, right? If you go back to the pharma value chain, uh, historically it has been in capital intensive from an R&D perspective. So typically most of the organizations what they did was they invested a lot of money in R&D and then they found a way to monetize it over a period of time in different forms and shape before they lost their IT on it, right? So obviously at some level you can call them Capitalist, because at the cost of human health and life, you're making money. But that's the business there. There's no two ways to it. Uh, but to your specific question, right? Uh, is, is this sustainable? Should businesses accept it uh, as as a, as a way of doing business now? Uh, you know, there are divergent views. You'll have uh, two lines of thought. Uh, companies that have a very heavy investment and looking at ROI from a stakeholder perspective would absolutely be on the other side of the spectrum. Say, so look, this is my IP, I demand a uh, ROI on my IP investment, right? And if I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to invest in more, the next drug, next iteration, and next life saving product, right? Uh, so that's a mind, line of thought. The other one says, look, this is something which people have beyond the point in time have. Let's take an example of COVID vaccine. Initially, it came at a certain price point. But given the socio-economic implication of that drug, governments intervene, businesses intervene, and with more supply and demand, the dynamics change in the price point. So to me, uh, pure sustainability at some level has to traverse that proprietary to social cause. Different drugs and different ingredients will have their own tangent to it. Uh, but, but as businesses, uh, you need to find the ethical right cutoff. It's a sector. It's not a one point in time. So I think as long as you're, you're headed towards the right end of the sector, it's sustainable. Uh, but if you are business, sit on a monopoly and say, well, this is it, take it or leave it, then obviously you're on the wrong end of it. Yeah. Thank you. I think. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead. Well, well uh, batted, I think. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. No, the problem is that you know, there are so many cases in India where MNCs have lost in okay. the courts of law mm -hmm. uh, on ground of evergreening. Okay. on grounds of this evergreening is such a big problem uh, in pharma that you change one part of the molecule a little bit and say that you're now a little new drug, okay. now 20 or more license I need to get, I need to get. So those are the problems which actually lead to this debate that uh, why not active ingredient based uh, you know, selling. So I'm sure all the companies, legitimate ones, organized ones, uh, do come in with a approval of the government of the day. When they come into a country, they can't really just come into a country and start selling. So, especially with countries like ours, where there is a lot of disparity, so the government has um, only got this DCPO, the drug pricing control mechanism, where we have put 400 or 800 drugs now. So, I think finally it will come to that, that you know, there will be a government take that as a winner. And then suddenly we will all become less sustainable. The problem is that, you know, the promise of India is that we have such a large market. We want to avail that, right? uh, Come onto the table that we are building and not your table. The problem is that there is a debate. I understand what you just said, but I think, I think there are enough cases uh, to indicate that it is not necessarily driven by the cost that you incurred 25 years ago. And in some cases, there are blatant misuse of this because in, in, a, in a country like America, there is a lot of public trust money 
which is used to fund these drug researches. Correct. Correct. So I, I think uh, I, I read about this analysis somewhere. At some point, it's celebrity is about the carrot stick and the baseball bat, right? <laughs> so let the carrots and the business cases solve it for you. Some bit of stick to make sure people are in the right direction. But more often than not, you need to go beat them black and blue before they realize the value of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panel members for answering the questions. Now, I would like Dr. Ramashankar to present a token of thanks to each of our panelists for taking time out to talk with us on this important theme.